Uh, Mr. Biden, if I can. Sure. Uh, questions and controversy continues today about Hunter Biden, your son's. Uh, there is no controversy about over my son. It's just questions. Lie. It's a flat lie. The 2024 Republican presidential primary field is taking shape. The battle lines are becoming clearer, and so is the field of candidates. Is the odds on favorites if you look at the polling still Trump versus Biden? That seems to be it, but it's just way too early to tell. I'm more angry now and I'm more committed now than I ever was. Big challenge for these candidates is going to be how do they navigate Donald Trump and, and how do they navigate Ron DeSantis? You and I have a rendezvous with them. Welcome back to the Ruthless Variety program. Another big week, fellas. It just feels like one after another. We're just killing it. Yeah. I mean... It, it, we have a fantastic guest today. We'll reveal we that do. in a second. But like, it's been a spree. We, yeah. We've had a number of great guests. I mean, we've been putting a lot of content and a out lot there. of news to, to to discuss. There's been a lot of news. Yeah, a lot of things. So in your opener there, that was a, I think it was a campaign era. Yeah. Statement from Joe Biden That's just lying through his mask, a as promise. they say. He 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 was. It was a promise. He was guaranteeing the American people <laughs> that his son Hunter Biden was doing nothing wrong. The funniest part about this is it's not only just like nothing wrong. It's everything wrong. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 like, okay, should he not have done crank shots to everybody in the world? Yeah, no, probably not. But like let's not pay attention to that. Oh, the tax fraud? Yeah, no, it's probably not that was probably not wise. Hopefully the statute of limitations expire on that. Oh, the FARA stuff? Oh yeah, no, I'm sure hoping the DOJ doesn't pay attention to that. Guns. Oh, the, the federal gun? Uh, federal gun? Uh, no. Uh, we got it from somebody else. It was in a dumpster. Yeah, yeah. It's like lying to the military. You're on drugs. Like, I mean, they're just like. I feel like Biden, Biden over the course of a couple of years, it really constantly outdoes him himself with the whoppers did you see the one recently about cancer where he said yeah that's cured unreal. cancer as we know it and then the, and then and then they had to have bracket man yeah did you see this today no so what happened is yesterday he said that he'd cured cancer as we know it yeah they said it couldn't be done he said yeah <laughs> but so, we've done it so the thing is it's not like it was a stutter no he, he didn't said, misspeak he, he in his mind he believed it he was like can you believe this folks we i cured cancer i cured cancer isn't that awesome and then, and then, like I quickly, you know, sort of did a little bit of research at the American Cancer uh, Association Institute, whatever it is, and it was like uh, six hundred nine thousand Americans died of cancer last year. So it doesn't seem to me like that's curing cancer. I, I heard from Joe Biden, and he is an honest and decent man, and that's why he was elected president. And so I think cancer has been cured. We can close the Mayo Clinic. It's out. It's all good. So but, that's that's how, also, I, that's how I heard. Up. Yeah, that's, this this is what's key. Bracket Man showed up today, and the official White House transcript reads that uh, we can ah. cure cancer. They, did, they just edited it. At, as we know it. It's like Joseph Stalin with the photos. It's like, <laughs> just disappears. I mean, well, it's just unbelievable. As, as you fellas know, your pal, Smash, has actually survived cancer about 10 years ago. You so did. When, when Joe Biden said that it was cured, I was like, oh, well, all of my anxiety over the last 10 years has been for naught. <laughs> Thank God Joe Biden cured it. I don't have to worry about a recurrence. Thank God. But then Bracket Man came in and ruined my day yeah. by telling me that it was a possibility. It's not just that Joe Biden has cured it. So I I mean it's been it's been a rough a real well, roller coaster. It is a roller coaster. Exactly. Old no, Smash has been on the roller coaster all day, and I hope I hope he's gonna be okay. Yeah. You should continue <laughs> drinking and smoking as much as you can. <laughs> it's the only way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so our guest today is a wonderful human being. He's the governor of North Dakota, presidential candidate, Doug Burgum. Uh, we had a blast with this guy. Yeah. yeah, not surprising. I mean, he's a Midwesterner. The guy has come up through so much adversity and has beat it every single time, which makes it exciting to see that he might do it again as a candidate for president. And I, I want to just say, I called it. I said early on, Bergamentum, don't sleep on this guy. You did. His story is something else. And, and I mean, I'm so excited for everyone who's going to see on YouTube this interview and the folks who are going to hear it because this guy's the real deal. Yeah, you're going to want to see that on YouTube. The guy's got that, a real head of hair. Yeah. And you pointed that out flawlessly. I thought that was a nice a nice segue. The guy's got our, good flow. I was on Fox last night and, and they mentioned Bergam in passing. Like, oh, can you believe this guy made the debate stage? And mm -hmm. I was like, don't sleep on that guy. Yeah. Brett kind of looked at me funny, but I was like, no, I think this. I mean, honestly, if you spend some time with him and you listen to him, 
this is not some also ran dude. Right. If you're interested in learning more about some of these candidates in the field, I think you're going to like Doug Burgum's story. You are going if you if you're anything but like, oh, reflexively uh, support somebody no matter what. You're going to like to hear what he has to say. You're going to like to hear about his background because this is a guy who has not taken no for an answer at any standpoint in his life. And I like him. I and again, like a good I, candidate, it's so wonderful that Ruthless exists to make sure we give a platform to conservatives who are running because the media will shut out any conservative mm-hmm. or attack them. You know, like mm-hmm. I think it's wonderful that so many folks are going to be able to listen to Bergam because he's got a very compelling story and he's in it to win it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, so anyway, we're that said, we're excited about our upcoming shows, obviously, in Iowa and Milwaukee for the debate. Uh, make your plans to be there. We're very excited. We're finalizing guest lists and all those things at all of these places. And you're not going to want to miss this. Yeah. It is just going to be fantastic. Isn't it, old man? Yeah. I mean, it's all coming together. Iowa's coming together. Milwaukee's coming together. I mean, I think we've got some great guests to announce for the Iowa mm-hmm. event at some some point. Um, we're going to have a venue here uh, shortly as well. Uh, and the Milwaukee thing's going to be incredible, dude. I think dude. we got a lot of ideas. I think we got a lot of stuff floating around the office. We got to put pen to paper and start narrowing it down, though. Yeah. We got a lot of ideas of ways yeah, to we're sing idea and dance guys, and, and we entertain. Need to, yeah. We got to execute. Lee's the execution guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way it works. Sorry, Wolf. It just, is, <laughs> just is what it is. Um, all right. So we start our Thursday the way we always do with the voice and the five stars, sir. Okay, so the first one comes from Mrs. Ninja One, and she titles her five star, Welcome to Milwaukee Ruthless. Yes. Mrs. Ninja One writes, First, I'd like to thank you for being excited to visit Milwaukee. And she puts in parentheses, unlike Stephen A. Smith, who called us a terrible city what? on ESPN when he came here for the NBA Finals. Wow. I like that she keeps the uh, chip on her shoulder yeah. about well, that. Well, that's classic Midwest yeah. style. Yeah. I, I love it. I identify with that yeah. entirely. Yeah. Yeah. If there's one person that says one bad thing, forever, forever, yeah. forever gone. It's, it's, yeah. It feels like home. She goes on to write, I've lived in Milwaukee my whole adult life and am so excited to have this conservative Republican energy visiting a mostly liberal city. That it is. I often feel like the only person who thinks like me and will only listen to podcasts with the windows closed, but I feel like I will finally be able to be myself. Yes, you Fellas, will. it's an amazing podcast. I constantly laugh out loud while walking my dog and listening. Keep it up. Nice. I love that. You want to make sure in this day and age, though, you've got a dog that can fend for itself. Right. And not turn on you because, you know, we don't have this in, we're not covering this today. I don't think we talked about it on Tuesday, but the Biden dog is attacked like what? Oh, we're covering. Ten Secret Service agents? We are going in depth on that story. Are we? A hundred percent. Is that in this? Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll wait on that then. Mm -hmm. But I mean, so you just want to keep your dogs. A hundred percent. Head on a swivel. Yeah. Keep your peepers popped. (laughs) <laughs> All right, Duncan, what do we got? This is from Meaty McMeat. Oh, I like that name. Uh, title is Okay, I Gotta Ask. Meaty McMeat writes, First of all, love the show. Found you cats through Megan Kelly and have listened to every episode for about a year. I love hearing the center-right analysis. The, expe- uh, the explanations of how things work to win elections is a great education, as I previously mostly heard farther-right opinions. And some of those folks don't know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, I just need to go farther right. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad. I actually don't think it's ideological, but yeah. let's revisit that. It's just about competence, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as the party moved more to the right, I, I'm probably closer to the center now, but still solidly GOP. So what is the deal with program? Mm. As a native Southern Virginian, I can't help but say program. Okay, well, that explains it. Curious about the origin. Also... I like to pick out accents. Does Holmes always talk like that? <laughs> I thought he's from Minnesota, but that doesn't sound Midwestern as much as it reminds me of, of Mike Myers' coffee talk Wait, sketch really? from the 1990s <laughs> SNL. I kid. Keep up with the good work, guys. Boy, am I just, uh, did I get an accent I didn't know about? You got to go more, you betcha. I just I should go straight back. I mean, look, if yeah. I get a couple of pops in me, I'll get right back into the northern Midwest, and and you're gonna not have any doubt where it's going. Yeah, I will say I do want to address this because 
I think in today's day and age, particularly in the media podcast mm -hmm. arena, there is a way that the mainstream corporate media has labeled what you're listening to. Mm -hmm. And what they label is the most offensive that you could be is the most conservative. And the most inoffensive, funny, hilarious, you know, sort of like digestible stuff that's persuasive and makes you think is center right. Mm. I don't think that has any bearing at all on where the ideological production of content comes from. I would argue that we're probably more conservative than any podcast in America, mm -hmm. but we're not going to tell you absolute bullshit, bonkers, right hand insanity that is fundamentally untrue mm -hmm. we're not yeah. we're not going to do that and so like they want to tell you that that means that somehow what you're listening to is not conservative because you might agree with it and they're going to want to tell you everything that, you, that sounds completely insane is conservative so it moves you off of labeling yourself a conservative and you label yourself a, a center right person. well because if they can if they can make conservative shorthand for crazy, yep. it's yep. easier for Democrats to win elections. That it, <laughs> it, it's right. And if you know, look, I'm not going to name the names, but there are there are podcasts out there that you listen to. If you actually listen to the substance of it, and you hear what they're talking about. They're not talking about fiscal conservatism. They're not talking about social conservatism. They're not about protecting our culture. They're not about you know, any of the things that make you conservative, mm -hmm. what they're talking about is their brand awareness of trying to be a cheerleader for one or two things. Right. And that is what is offensive to, at this point, 55, 60%, according to polling, the electorate. And so the media wants to tell you that that's conservative. Right. The mm -hmm. left is incapable of being around people who think differently than them they just they just can't they can't deal with it and as conservatives we know that we're right and we actually like being around people who think differently than us because we're not afraid of what we believe we know that it's actually the right way to think and if somebody offers like a different point of view we're like okay well that's your point of view we're american and everybody's allowed to have an idea but as conservatives we know we're right. It, it, it's a frustrating, before I move on, and I hate to belabor this, but I really think it's important, is it's a frustrating part about being a conservative in this day and age is that those on the right who are, are sort of put in that far right category benefit from the mainstream media's uh, characterization of mm -hmm. them as far right, where you're like, I'm really conservative, and so I identify with something that's not what's happening in Washington, D.C. right now, not with Joe Biden, and I'm, like, I, I'm all the way to the right. And so they tell you that that is what it is that you believe. And so you gravitate towards stuff that's like bonkers shit. And and that's not conservative. Like ultimately, what's conservative, it is not conservative to tell somebody who is 30 years old right now that Social Security is totally fine and we ought to actually expand the eligibility for it right. and don't worry about a, 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 sing, a single thing. Like, that's not a conservative thing to say. But you get that from the far right conservative podcast. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anyway, I just think this is a point worth making. Be careful about other people outside of your ideological lane labeling what it is that you are yeah if you're a conservative you're a conservative and the far right thing more often than not is not conservative at all all right well let's, said let's get to this third thing so this is from lizzie boo in memphis the title is hashtag barbenheimer it says hey fellas i'm one of the many who came to y'all from mk thank you so much and now I look forward to Tuesdays and Thursdays and Friday this week. When y'all talked about Barbenheimer, I knew I had to comment. Tomorrow is our 17th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And to celebrate while the in-laws have the kids, we're going to eat a nice meal, and then he's going to Oppenheimer, and I'm going to Barbie. Nice. Win-win. We bought our tickets on Monday to make sure we got seats. Anyways, keep up the good work, and I'm trying to get my husband to listen to y'all. I know he'd love it. Love from Memphis. Thank you so much. For awesome. That. Yeah. Awesome. And Memphis is it. a great town. I highly recommend everyone visit that Bass Pro Pyramid. I had yeah. a blast. Totally. And the barbecue is just uh, yeah. out great of food. this world. Out of this world. All right. So uh, on Thursdays, we like to 
play a little sort of internal discussion well, about who won the week mm -hmm. in the presidential nomination mm -hmm. contest. And we always have a, a range of opinions based upon the news. Um, let's start this week. There's a lot of news out there. Smash, let's start with you. Well, this week I was fully prepared to challenge the old man and his opposition to Vivek Ramaswamy <laughs> because I felt like he's been hustling and I think he's getting ready for a debate and I think he's probably going to wow a lot of people when he steps on that stage. But this morning, and um, of course we're recording this on Wednesday night for Thursday morning, this morning I read a story about how he did a, a, a concert <laughs> as uh, Eminem. And Devek is, I think, the way he labeled it. The stage stuff. name? That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's that's right. And and as much as I love my hometown guy, uh, I, I, I don't think I can give it to him. <laughs> uh, that, that threw you off of it. I don't think I can give it to him this week, given the Devek and given the voting controversy. There was some story. I don't know if you guys saw this about, oh, about how, he, he, how he, he said he first voted in 2020 and right. he actually voted in 2004 for some right. dingbat. Right. So I was prepared to give it to Vivek. But honestly, fellas, I, I am going to give this week to Ron DeSantis, and here's why. What? Here's what why. a here's why. wild take. Here's why. Okay. Here's why. Because I think that winning elections is about a lot of things, and one of them is being honest with yourself. And if by any objective standard, if Ron DeSantis looked at the, the last few weeks and the production of his campaign team he could not look at it and think, okay, well, we're doing, we're doing all the right stuff. And what he did this week is switched everything up. He's reevaluating what he's doing and he's being honest with himself and saying, if I wanna win, I need to adjust and move forward in a different way. And I think that that's an important component for anybody who's in his situation to be able to rise up and sort of get back to where he was and so, therefore, this week, I think Ron DeSantis, because of the adjustments he's made, wins the week. A very nuanced take very from nuanced. Smash. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I didn't see that coming, but uh, well articulated. Duncan, what do you think? Oh, geez. Uh, well, I'm not going to say Ron DeSantis. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think any week in which you, you know, fire 30, 38 Eight? people from your campaign, which for some reason had a whole 92 93 people in the first six weeks um makes you you win you win the week um and you know i mean like he's had a lot of missteps here like i think we all talked about on the show his announcement he also got in a car crash horrible that, a tough um, day. he got in a car crash this week too. yeah tough got a car day. crash they've had a lot of you know some issues with videos posted from campaign people and then this other guy had to get fired in this this last round of firings it, it doesn't look good look good you know like it a lot of people will tell you it looks like he's doing the scott walker speed run mm. you know it's like huge blow to campaign i i i hear what ashbrook's saying about like you know if you're going to have something like this happen better earlier than later um and if he can write the ship that's great but i mean you know, his biggest argument against uh, Donald Trump is I'm a winner and you lost. And the series of stories and everything does not make him look like a winner. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, he's he's going to have to do a lot. I like all the people there on the campaign, but there's got to be something to write the ship. I think the winner of the week is Doug Burgum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he you know, when Burgum Bucks came out, the gift card, you know, $20 gift card for a $1 donation you know, a lot of people doubted whether you could actually get there if you could mm -hmm. get to 40,000. Yeah. And, um, you know, we had him on, on the show and uh, I can't wait for you guys to listen to that interview. He has a lot to say about that. Um, but I, I, I mean, the guy uh, is polling at like 5% in New Hampshire in the last New Hampshire poll. Yeah. 6%. Or 6%. Yeah. You know, governor of North Dakota, no national profile. He's never been on Fox News oh, prime six, time. Six weeks into his campaign. Six weeks into his campaign. Yeah. And the guy's like, I don't know, he's got to be worth a couple hundred million dollars. So, you know, you know, like he's already done. He's done the hard part. He's yeah. gotten on the debate stage. So I think for a guy like Burgum, like he's there, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, you're going to hear from him. Great personality. Great story. I mean, the guys, when he gets on that stage, he's going to have something to say. So I got to give it to him. 
All right, Smug, what's your take? Well, I was going to pick Bergam, and I'm going to stick with Bergam. I think Duncan made a lot of really great points. Getting on the debate stage at all is a huge accomplishment. To get it done as quickly and in an innovative way like he did, is it speaks yet again to this guy's a problem solver. Uh, his polling continues to surge. You'll hear about you know his visit to Iowa during the interview, but essentially what's becoming kind of a story around Bergam is if you hear him, you like what you hear, and you start getting behind the guy, which for him, getting on that debate stage makes him dangerous. This yep. guy is dangerous for everyone in the field. And I remember, I called it first. I called it first. He also was shrewd enough to get here on the show in the midst of all this like good news that's coming for him while you have another major candidate seeming under like a deluge of bad news. He won the week, and, and that guy's got momentum. Well-timed, yeah. Yeah, it was well-timed. It was well-timed. And I think, uh, given the fact, if it wasn't for you two previously saying Berg, my, that's probably where my head would be at. I think he actually came to D.C. and did a really nice job working through the media. Like, if you notice all the news clips that came out, they were all total center-of-the-head conservative message points. Yeah. But there were in brief snippets... They didn't have, it wasn't like this bizarre sort of long form thing that people needed to snip around and try to figure out whether they agree with them or not. He hit the points on each and every network that he needed to. And then he came into the, you'll hear him. You'll hear him. And, yeah, and, and along and those lines, like that. I feel like for him specifically, whenever he articulates a conservative ideal, it's directly connected to part of his story. Every single conservative the point that he brings up that front. goes directly into part of his life story. So he's just basically just speaking from the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So honestly, if I'm not going to pick Burgum, uh, I'm going to say it's Trump. And the reason that I'm going to say it's Trump is because, A, there was no indictment this week, which everybody anticipated that was coming. And B, he didn't really do anything. I mean, literally, did you hear anything from Trump this week? Did anybody hear anything from Trump this week? No. I don't like think he, so. maybe he did maybe one event. I don't know. But like barely anything. And then you get a whole rash of new polls and shows that he's basically in the same place. DeSantis has dropped off the map. You now have Tim Scott and Nikki Haley in competition in South Carolina and Iowa kind of looks like he's got the same amount of lead over everybody else. And like he didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think for Donald Trump, any week that you don't take a step back is a winning week mm -hmm. well the other thing he did uh to buttress that argument there holmes is i saw that he endorsed that rnc plan to bank your vote mm. early voting and absentee by mail fantastic uh which is huge you know i've been very critical of the fact that like, i would love it a lot more if he actually said it in, tor in terms of like actually going on air when yeah. asked about it rather well, than just right. endorsing it well, but i get your point but he he, he did a whole video yeah no i, you know? I got the video yeah. and i think that was well done and yeah. I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of yeah. work that went into that and it's the right thing to do so right. you're right i would also like him no to look i agree when sean Hannity asks him whether you know that's a good way to vote and he doesn't say it's fraud that right. would be also helpful well yeah and he's i mean he still has to end the whole thing saying you know well 2020 was rigged we got to make sure they don't make 2024 <laughs> rigged right so make sure you vote you know there's a little sort of cognitive dissonance to that but as a half measure it's something and uh it's a lot more than he did last time and we got crushed in mail so it's an improvement for sure and I, I listen i'm glad that you you raised that because I, I do think that piece of it is really important and i think that trump has gotten away from the discussion uh in terms of proactively talking about 2020 which mm -hmm. It has clearly bolstered him in the polls. But those people who were involved in 2020, namely his attorneys, mm -hmm. have not. And things that you're not going to hear in conservative media because they are inconvenient truths are things like what happened to Rudy Giuliani. Uh, there was a story in Politico about how Giuliani won't contest Georgia election workers' claims that he falsely accused them of manipulating ballots. Mm. So this is a civil lawsuit that is happening against Rudy Giuliani that uh, there was all the evidence that was submitted uh, of what Rudy Giuliani claimed was happening in Georgia and then all the evidence that was submitted about what was actually happening. And the gulf there was such 
that he's not defending it. Yeah. He's saying that what he said was inaccurate. He's he's admitting as much. You look at what's the other Georgia guy? Uh Lynn Wood. Lynn Wood. He resigned his bar license for yeah. saying the same thing so he wouldn't get disbarred. You have uh Powell, Sidney Powell. Yeah. Mm-hmm whose argument in civil court was no reasonable person would believe what I'm saying, Mm -hmm. therefore I'm innocent. And like all of these things, these are all of his attorneys. These are the people that we heard from immediately after the November election in 2020. And so the further that Donald Trump gets away from that, obviously the better he is because look what's happening here. Mm This yeah. is not, this is not, I mean, look, if there was a little bit of gray area here, do you think that Rudy Giuliani, one of the best prosecutors in the history of this country, couldn't figure out a way to wriggle out of that? Of course he could. Mm-hmm. Of course he could. I would have some doubts after I saw the hair dye running down his face. <laughs> I mean, if that, I, was if a I'm good, being that was a good sign. But I mean, like, look, dude, I, the, the, the problem for Donald Trump, and I think it's been well documented, well well reported around the 2020 election and thereafter, is he shops around for an opinion he agrees with when people tell him no. And he had a lot of very smart lawyers who told him, you know, we need to pursue this thing and look into this thing for fraud. And he didn't didn't like when they, when they conducted their investigations and couldn't substantiate things. And so he stopped listening to them. Hmm. And that's how you end up with a meeting before January 6th where Sidney Powell is talking about seizing the Ven- Venezuelan voting machines and fucking you got my, the My Pillow the guy, pillow guy and in then there. The out overstock.com guy, yeah. which we did a great piece on. Yeah, if you and, haven't listened to that, you should the, go back. And, and the only reason I bring all of that up is because it's still a problem that's happening to Donald Trump. There's some... Ho- a bunch of background on the Mar-a-Lago docs case yeah. in which he was listening to that fitting guy from Judicial Watch, yeah. not like his lawyers who are trying to keep him out of jail or make sure he, he doesn't get in trouble with the feds. No, he's listening to other people who are like, no, you know, you can keep all these docs. Yeah. You know, and so like, I mean, that's that's a concern for Donald Trump is like he has to learn to listen to the right people. And can he learn to do that? I don't know. I don't know. I, but this I, is a good test. I mean, look, this is why presidential primaries are important. Yeah. Because we're going to find out over the next six months whether or not he can do that. And I think the more that he can do that, the stronger that he gets. The more that he keeps entertaining the nonsense. I think the- he just waits around for somebody to tell him, yes, you're doing the right thing. And and it's not. it's been proven that it's not in his best interest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so with this bank the vote thing, it is... It's countervailing information. I'm glad to see it. Hopefully, he continues to do it. And we I, all we all know it's essential. We, yeah, we all know it is essential. We've worked enough for races Republican to know success. Yes, that we have to vote early. If Democrats are voting early, we have to vote early. Yep. We cannot just let them have it, and that's why it's so important what the RNC is doing. That's why what Michael just said. It just you cannot emphasize it enough. It is huge that Donald Trump is like we need we need to support. Bank the vote. Dude, snow, snowstorm in rural Nevada on election day. Yep. You know, Laxalt could have won that. What lost by 0.8%. Yeah. And they had banked all these early votes and all this absentee by there mail. There was 57% of, of conservative voters turn out in these rural areas where everyone got a ballot in the mail. Right. Still didn't turn it in. Yeah. Because Donald Trump said no vote on election. Which which is <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, it is the it is we are just shooting our you know self in the foot. But it's why I say thank God for Rana, because she has put such an emphasis on this program. It's a big deal. She really, really wants this to work. She's yeah. doing more than anybody ever has in the past. And it's a different election, you know? It it's never been this big of a deal in the past. We know looking at the twenty twenty two election how important it is. She saw the same thing that everybody else saw and she's doing something about it. Yeah. 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 All right. So uh here's the big news of the week. And this is the one that everybody's talking about. The big news of the week is you heard Speaker McCarthy go on Sean Hannity's show on Fox and talk about whether or not an impeachment inquiry might be necessary in terms of the information that the committees, both the Oversight Committee and the Judiciary Committee have obtained related to Hunter Biden, Mm -hmm. related to whether or not President Joe Biden was in business with Hunter Biden, and related to whether the Justice Department had a special set of circumstances in prosecuting Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I found this, this was a classic Kabuki theater DC thing. 
right? Because anytime a Speaker of the House says impeachment, all of a sudden it changes everything, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and like people, we go back and forth. There's been a long time before the Clinton impeachment, you know, you dealt with the Nixon discussion, but people, you just didn't impeach presidents. Like it just, you know, there's differences, but you didn't, the threshold for that was pretty high. Let me just suggest that's that when Speaker McCarthy says an impeachment inquiry might be necessary, when the established facts are that Hunter Biden obtained contracts from foreign vendors, some potential foreign government actors that uh, hired him for things like specialties in energy expertise. I mean, this guy's the furthest thing from an energy mm -hmm. expert that there is. But he gets these tens of millions of dollars. You have an FBI report that has been undercover saying uh, that one of the people at Burisma said that it was a payoff to Joe mm -hmm. and to Hunter. And then you have him actually collecting the money actually collecting the money and then the president of the united states during the course of the campaign saying he never dealt with never spoke with hunter about this at all and then you've come to find out that that is untrue yeah and corinne jean pierre now refuses to speak on that you have a fact pattern that is establishing what you would look for in a potential criminal problem but more importantly that's what impeachment was invented for this is what, if it is established that a president of the United States is acting or has acted as a government actor against the best interests of the American people for his own financial gain, that is what impeachment is for. Yeah. No brainer. That is what it is established for. Have they proven that? No. And that's not what Kevin McCarthy is saying. What he's saying is we've got testimony next week of some guy who we tried to subpoena like three times and he didn't wouldn't come and now we finally got him who's gonna say that this guy was on conference calls with Burisma and Joe Biden and Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. That is not just not talking to your son about his business dealings. Yeah. That's not what that is. If that pattern fact pattern is established, I don't care what the mainstream media says about the relevance of this or not this is the core of why impeachment is actually yeah in shrine well do you, you remember in the clinton uh impeachment it was the the joke was like what does the word is mean yeah is you it. know as what is 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 this as as the attorneys were sort of try to parse the language just try to get him out of that now you're seeing with the Biden administration and Karine Jean-Pierre. Karine Jean-Pierre. They've sort of massaged the language a little bit. It used to be, uh, you know, Joe Biden's never had any conversations about business with Hunter Biden. And now the line is... Been in business. In business. Yep. Joe Biden has never been in business with his son. Well, no shit, he hasn't been on the fucking articles of incorporation, you know? <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but we already know that there is email traffic about him obtaining a key yeah. to the office. And the 10% for the big guy. And and like, uh, we don't know what the 10%, but we know what Bob Alinsky said. And, for and, it. And, and we know that there's been reporting that Hunter Biden was paying Joe Biden's bills at various times. He talks about it, about how he needs money. And now he's, you know, he's got to pay these bills for Joe. It's like, yeah, maybe he was holding it in escrow for his dad. As and, part of this arrangement. And at this point, the Democrats' defense is basically, you need to just take their word for it. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, there's nothing corrupt here. Well, the people they're asking us to take their word for it are the same, it's the same guy who started painting two years ago, <laughs> pulled out the watercolor set that he bought from Kmart. <laughs> And all of a sudden, he sold a painting for $1.3 million at some New York gallery to somebody who ultimately is appointed to some who knows what board by Joe Biden. That's the thing. So the, what, what Africa is speaking about has recently been reported. This is from the New York Post. It says, Democrat donor who bought Hunter Biden's art visited White House a dozen times. It's from the New York Post. It says, a Democrat donor who purchased a piece of artwork by first son Hunter Biden and was later appointed to a prestigious commission visited the White House 13 times in the past year and a half, 
visit our log show. It says El Elizabeth Hirsch Naftali attended several crowded events with President Biden between September 22nd and March 2023, uh, 2023 and also enjoyed a one on one meeting with White House senior oh, advisor Nita Attendant. Yep. Nita Attendant. Let's, oh, yeah, let's. Nira. Yeah, of yeah, course. Let's, let's who, just. Who wouldn't want a meeting with Nira? <laughs> let's just be clear about what this artwork is. I have plenty of artwork on my wall that my kids have painted, and it's priceless to me. But Hunter Biden is not putting up a happy tree. It's not a landscape in the in the great <laughs> themes of Bob Ross. It is literally triangles. <laughs> Bob Ross. It is literally triangles and trapezoids and these abstract shapes on some canvas that yeah. he probably threw paint on while on coke. Like there is, it's not art. He should it's really, not art, honestly, should, it's corruption. He, he should just paint a rectangle that says admission one, and it's your White House pass. You just pay a million right. dollars, and now you get to hang out at the White House. Because can I, can this I, is just He does like up. a painting of a check, and can, he's like, <laughs> made to the order of Hunter Biden. Can, 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 I, can I say, like, I, it, it seems that the art thing, first of all, he's a shitty artist. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen any of this stuff, but no. it's, not, it's not great. No. It's not great. You wouldn't. Nobody would buy it. It's certainly not like Masterworks. Yeah. which invests in uh, priceless collections and sponsor right. the program. Um, this is stuff that I think is totally premeditated mm -hmm. and, and thought through in a very sinister way. For example, one of the other buy reported buyers is somebody that they call his sugar brother, Kevin Morris, a wealthy lawyer who reportedly loaned him $2 million dollars to pay his back taxes. Just two mil between friends. So okay, all right. So wait. So how do you get? How do you get somebody whose father is the president of the United States to forgive a two million dollar loan? I don't know. Just like fucking sketch something on a piece of paper and yeah. send it to me, and I'm buying your art, pal. Yeah, totally. Right. Right. He's Picasso. Yay, oi, Kusama. Throwing some dots on a page. <laughs> And all of a sudden, everybody wants to go see it. Thanks, Hunter. My God, he is really talented. I, do we have to? I mean, I, I can't believe we're doing it. I literally can't, I, I can't believe we're having this conversation. Yeah, I can't do we either. we really, as a country, need to have a conversation about whether or not Hunter Biden is a serious fucking artist? I can't, I can't believe this it. This is either. a person who's an artist? I can't. It's more evidence that the media helps Democrats because it should be front page news because it's the con of the century. But they do it. I think they do this shit because, number one, yes, they know the media will cover for them. But number two, because it's about hierarchy. They want, they'll put it in everyone's face. They're like, of yeah. course we could do what we want. Because we're, we're Democrats. Right, exactly. We can say that, oh, we're for the poor, and then we have this guy is having a pay-to-play scheme, They're not millions the of dollars with, with his sugar brother. They right. put it in everyone's face. That They're like, oh, the, we're untouchable. They we'll hate get the this poor. kid a plea bargain. Right. And I, I, I want to remind everybody of one more fact that we've talked about on this program before that is somehow escaping the conversation that we're having about all of this which is that Joe Biden said to camera and bragged about how he forced Ukraine to fire a corrupt prosecutor, in his words, corrupt prosecutor, mm -hmm. in order to get aid from the United States to Ukraine. Right. The corrupt prosecutor happened to have, number one on his docket, Burisma. So, look, if you are Kevin McCarthy... And you're looking at a fact pattern that says, here's a president who lied about whether he ever talked to his his son about it. We've got money transfers coming to him. And other we, members of the family. We have yeah. and other mem members of the family. We have people from Burisma saying there was a payoff to Joe. Mm -hmm. And we have a official government action as vice president to actually direct aid to benefit that company. I mean, it certainly it certainly sounds like enough for an inquiry. <laughs> I don't know, guys. Are we serious? I, I, like, are we serious? I don't know. <laughs> I don't, are we serious? I, I don't know, guys. I don't know. I think that the the Washington Post and the New York Times are probably right for not looking into this. <laughs> what I would ask Lee to do uh, is to pop up on the screen one of Hunter's uh, famous art pieces so that the, the viewers can see it and judge for themselves. And they will know at this point as they're looking at this art. 
uh, that there's no reason for the for any of the mainstream media to look into it. <laughs> oh, is it, a fine piece? is it a fine piece? Well, just just you look for yourself. I mean, there's a series of shapes and lines and colors. And My son is four, and his painting looks better than this. I. It's not exactly a Rothko. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, it's like I don't I don't get modern art. This is the shittiest modern art I've ever seen. <laughs> It's astonishing. It is absolutely astonishing. Again, I can't believe we're having this conversation. Oh, man. Okay. You guys want some animal news? Always. Always. All right. So uh, a firearm uh, discharges in an apartment after a cat uh, knocks it off the table in uh, Manassas. I call it Manassas. Virginia. Hmm. Uh, Do we? We just had uh, uh, maybe a month ago about a dog firing a gun. Well, this is a talking point. Now we got the cat. This is a talking point of of Smash, our resident expert on uh, animal. What did she say? Tranquility. The uh, uprising. The uprising. Well, he is the executive director of People for the Ethical tre- Treatment of People. Right. That's right. Yeah, people that. are more important than animals. Yeah, that's so, exactly right. So, p- police have charged an adult man with reckless handling of a firearm after his cat allegedly knocked the weapon uh, from a table which discharged upon contact with the ground. According Mm -hmm. to police, the accused 29-year-old Christopher Michael Moore was preparing his handgun for cleaning in his apartment, uh, and it was located in Manassas, when his uh, cat allegedly knocked the weapon from the table. The round fired and entered into an occupied neighborhood, neighboring apartment. Jeez. No injuries were reported. A wall and ceiling uh, in the neighboring apartment were damaged. Mm-hmm. So my question is this, Smash, as a resident expert here on the program, should the man be charged here? Yeah, this is... <laughs> This is the clearest evidence yet that animals have full control over the libs. They full control over the libs. On what planet does a cat shoot a gun and then they find the owner liable? These animals are out of control. We know this. We've seen the evidence time and time again. You guys, I know, agree with me. Well, I I agree with you. I just, I think even more than being a bad gun owner, it's being a bad cat owner. Because if you have a cat, you know one thing. You can't have like a glass of water on the table. You know, you can't leave stuff there. You don't want to get knocked off. This is cat behavior. My they, God. They knock stuff off tables. They knock stuff off of I think the island in the, the kitchen. I think you the only one here who's had a cat. Have you, Smug, have you had a cat? No, but I, I dispute the fact that there's a good cat owner. Is there like... No, 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 no. What's no. that situation? I don't, it's not a bad cat I, owner. Hold on, hold on, hold on, concern. hold on. All there, cat owners there are, are bad. Good, there all there bad are good cat owners. I do not think there's a good cat. Cats, I think all cats are demons. <laughs> cats are disgusting. They have that disease, you know, the the brain disease that they give people, like toxic uh, plasmosis. plasmosis. Yeah. yeah. So, like, what? number one, yeah, this is like it's, they, it's lots in, of cats. It's in their feces. Yeah. And the thing is, is that here's the other thing. And they shit inside. That's the thing. Then they walk around in it, and then they jump on your, on people's beds and walk around on so, the floor. Okay, but covered all, in the dog, actually, all, there's toxic th- all of those everywhere. Th- this is disgusting. All of those things being said, if a cat shoots a gun at somebody, <laughs> put it in a canvas bag and throw it in a swimming pool. <laughs> For crying out loud, it does not. The, the the owner shouldn't be charged. The cat should be euthanized. I mean, oh, that's man. probably the most humane approach. Yeah. Oh, there's it's a more. controversial take. Yeah, we we do have more animal news. This is did we you... do, and this is what we previewed at the top, right? Yes, this is the the dog. And <laughs> fellas, I gotta tell you, I may be getting older and losing my mind, but I could have sworn that Joe Biden gave his dog away. Previous like dog a year ago. Yeah, previous. This dog. is the other dog. Yeah. it's a pattern. So, so this is the other so dog. Wait, that h- help me with this. Because now there's a story uh, in the New York Post, and it was everywhere uh, today, about how Biden's dog, Commander, uh, sent Secret Service officer to hospital and bit six others uh, after replacing his first pooch, Major. Mm -hmm. So Major, I remember, first of all, it broke his arm during the campaign or something like that. Didn't he blame the dog? Wasn't he getting out of the shower and trying to pull its tail or something? He was naked, getting out of the shower, and he pulls the dog's tail, and the dog like loses his mind. It is wild. Thinking back that that was the best excuse that he could come up he with. He came that, up with that. That was the normal story. Yeah, <laughs> that was the normal story. And 
then Major like went on a biting spree once he got to the White House, and then they gave it away. Yeah. When did they get this other fucking dog? So I think they were there at the same time. And yeah. it was like the whole Biden thing. They want you to believe, oh, there's one good kid, one bad kid. They're all rotten. Oh every every Biden is rotten. They're all terrible people. It's been like that forever. They yeah. bang each other's wives. They're disgusting people. Oh, and what do you geez. think the dog? The dogs are seeing this and they're like, well, I learned it from you. Yeah. You know, these people are animals. Yeah, they don't believe it's, it's like they're, they're lawless monsters. I agree. I'll be one too. I agree, Smug. It's just like those anti-drug <laughs> ads. Where oh. where where the the dad has the cigar box and he finds the marijuana in it, and the kid says, "I learned it from watching I'm, you." I'm sending this, I'm sending this to Lee. That will be added in. <laughs> <laughs> Who taught you how to do this stuff? You all right? I learned it by watching you. Parents who use drugs have children who use drugs. This is learned behavior from a family that is, you know, degenerate. So that is what this is about. Okay, yeah. so uh, the shocking spate of incidents involving Commander, none of them previously reported. Minor attacks involving Major, the uh, who the White House says was given to family and friends after biting many Secret Service members in 2021. So I just want to get this straight: the first dog, yeah. They gave away because they bit the shit out of the security in the White House. Mm -hmm. They kept the second dog, which I haven't... Have you seen this dog? Yeah, it, it looks they like look, a, a demon. It's a horrible dog. It, it, the same. Post has it on the cover. It just looks like a monster. It, it's seen some shit is the thing. The New York Post headline is, 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 is just quintessential New York Post. There's easily a startled... Con I'm sorry, excuse me, let me start over again. There's easily startled, confused creature in the White House. Prone to fits of anger, there's also a German Shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> Commander in chomp. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, like, oh. So, so I, I think the facts of this are important. So we already discussed, yes, Major was going ham. They sent it away. Commander follows in his footsteps. He goes full Biden, breaks the law, starts biting people, is uncontrollable. And and the thing is that, yes, it's biting Secret Service members, but it's not like, you know, they the dog- They sent a Secret Service guy to a local hospital. That's the thing. Do you know how hard that is? So, so like, it's, it's tough not, dudes. It bit seven agents. But but it's not like it just, you know, it's wandering the White House and they'll just bite a guy. One of these occasions, uh, it, it, it says, uh, November 10th, a Secret Service uh, officer was bitten on the left thigh by commander <laughs> while First Lady Jill Biden walked the dog. Wait, so they know it was on the damn leash. Yeah, they know it's 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 it was on the leash, and she's cool with it. Everybody knows that this dog is a demon. There's even um, some color in here. The back and forth between uh, the Secret Service Joint Operations <laughs> Center. A Secret Service member wrote, "What a joke! If it wasn't their dog, he would already have been put down." Freaking clown needs a muzzle. <laughs> <laughs> he says, and the dog's bad too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Un unclear if they're talking about Joe or Hunter or the dog. <laughs> I saw Commander exit the Kennedy Garden and sprint towards me. I immediately stopped and put my hands up. Commander then bit me on my left thigh and ran back towards the First Lady. An officer wrote in an email to his superiors. He's like, I did it, just like you said. And she's like, Good. Nod. <laughs> yeah, good dog. She's like, remember, dog, I'm a doctor. Right. The Secret right. Service guy's like, I've been hurt. She's like, I'm a doctor. <laughs> didn't see any, it didn't see any, like, did she, was she, can, can you imagine your, imagine your reaction as a dog owner, by the way, mm -hmm. if your dog did that oh, to somebody. you'd be horrified. You'd be, you, you'd, you'd be beside yourself. You'd never forget I mean, it. this has, I'd this, never, for, I would never literally, I would be, I would be post-traumatic about right. the whole thing. Th this That's has right everything right. about the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Right. When Trump's in office, you support our troops. He had a veteran dog out there celebrate his achievement yep. hunting down a terrorist. Yep. These dogs now under Democrats, they hate law enforcement. Yeah. They learn again, yet again from the Bidens. They hate law enforcement. And and it seems like, you know, if the first lady's watching the dog bite the police, they don't care. They're totally okay with it. Listen, wait, hold on, there's more. On Christmas Eve, a Secret Service inspector wrote to colleagues that one day prior, another officer was bitten while uh, posted uh, at the location yesterday. Uh, nearly every official in the room with me today spoke about a specific incident surrounding the first family's dog, the inspector email said. On January 2, an agency technical security investigator was attacked when investigating an alarm at the president's Wilmington home where he often spends the weekend. Quote, 
Commander squeezed his way through the door and immediately bit slash latched onto the lower right side okay. of my back. Oh, my God. It's going for the kidney. It wants a kill shot. Yeah. Yeah, this guy's just trying to protect the president of the United States. He's working over the holidays. On Christmas Eve, yeah, could, that hey, person hey, sent Merry an Christmas, email. Merry Christmas, buddy. If I, if I Merry had, Christmas, it, pal. Here's my dog. Hope he got a bonus. Here's the thing. Here's the thing is, okay. It's Suck in, on my shepherd. It's, you, in, it's in the Wilmington house. <laughs> We know Hunter spends a lot of time there. We know sometimes where the binds are, you find cocaine. This dog's <laughs> out of his mind. But it might be like, you know, Hunter oh, understands troubled animals. Dog? Totally. And he was probably like, listen, dog, I'm keeping the documents here in, 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 next to dad's vet. Yeah. If you see anyone, go ham. I'll give you another gram. Like, oh, that's it. Okay. So the dog's like, you know, an attack dog. It's, it's an interesting trained. theory. 100%. It's like if anyone is sniffing around the documents, you let them know what's up. The White House <laughs> blamed the incident on what it called a unique and often stressful environment for family pets. Yeah. At the executive mansion, the first family is working through ways to make the situation better for everyone, said Elizabeth Alexander, communications director for First Lady Jill Biden. They've been partnering with the Secret Service and the executive residence staff on additional leashing protocols and training as well as established designated areas for commander to run an exercise. Wow. Oh, it's so nice for them to partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? And by partner, I mean, I'm going to let my German shepherd off the leash and it's going to bite the fuck out of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's and thing. you're going to say, I wish it hadn't bit the fuck out of me. Yeah. yeah. That's the partnership that we're talking about here. Honestly, it's pretty clear this is a bad dog. Wow. You know, Joe Biden, has he ever raised, a, a, you know, anything that didn't become troubled and crazed and, and attacked people? This is just a standard pattern. Horrible family raises horrible dogs. That's the story here. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just... I did read something about how uh, there are dog trainers who have theories about these kind of things. Oh, interesting. I'd, I'd and like there was a dog this. trainer that said, oftentimes when you encounter a well-bred dog mm -hmm. that didn't have like traumatic... Uh, experiences as a young dog, not somebody who was adopted in a traumatic situation, but like a, just a well-bred dog, mm -hmm. as this one mm -hmm. yeah. appears to be, that um, you can tell a lot about the dog's behavior based on the organizational skills and the calmness of the home. Mm. Oh, wow. And that the more chaotic and weird a house is, the more chaotic and weird the dog is. In, in fact, they reflect back Mm. The personalities of the people yeah. who train them. Your, your anxieties become their anxieties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it's kind of like kids. Yeah. So Biden's losing his cool on a daily basis with his staff and everybody else. And the dog is doing this. Well, same we already thing. read about that. Yeah. We already read about that. I mean, who knows, dude? I mean, this whole thing is unbelievable to me. I mean, you read about Hunter, you read about the dog. Uh, what's going on? Bad over? family. What's going Bad on? Bad family, 100%. There? Um, all right, so the last thing I want to cover, because I really think that you, I want your input on this, is that there was a piece in the New York Post about AI influencers. You see this? Looking at it now. What, what does that mean? What's an AI so influencer? So it's basically a AI, an artificial intelligence creates a person. Okay. So not, not a real person. It doesn't actually exist. Okay. Oh, got it. That becomes okay. an influencer. And in this case... Uh, they've created a really super hot babes, babe. Yeah, mm. right. And they're working it around, and they're trying to get to the butt. Like, what what impact on society does this have? Right. So her fans think they found true love, but she's not real. Uh, Malia Sophia is an artificial intelligence generated influencer whose sultry photos on Twitter and TikTok are racked up thousands of likes from deluded social media users. Uh, she says, quote, I'm a 19 year old girl from Helsinki, Finland. Mm. Uh, I was made by AI. Check my other social media accounts and link below. Anyway, the, the fact of the matter is she's got tremendous engagement. And if you've seen the photo, uh, you can understand how people who spend their time on social media uh, sort of horny liking uh, could do that. This is horrific. I mean, again, this is another example. If I had to guess where this is coming from. The number one sign, it says this uh, AI is on TikTok. This 100% is China. 100%, mm. you know, China's creating Interesting. this. They don't want, 
you know, uh, folks in America to, to have happy families, normal lives. They're like, no, get on TikTok. We will show you the most degenerate shit. TikTok's banned in China. Their version of TikTok only shows like inspirational stuff, like farmers having great harvests and like a new dam that they built. Here in America, you see literally hell on earth on TikTok of like, oh, you know, I have a mental disorder. That's all you see on TikTok here to convince kids now you've got a mental disorder. What else are they going to show kids? Fake, you know, half naked AI influencers. At what point? At what point? And this, this is one hundred percent Chinese. This is going to make me it. sound a little old. But at what point as a society do we get to the point with this where it overruns the dam and we get to a level where we're just interacting in person again? I think that's a great part of it. I mean, that's a huge part of because, it. Because, I mean, it, this it, is I, all fake, right? I mean, this is a, this is look, somebody who's 100% fake that there are millions of people interacting with. It's not a real pro – it's some, some like, D-bag in his, his sweatpants yeah. sitting in the bottom with, like, a half-mast right. uh, dictating uh, sultry comments towards users. Right. And all of a sudden – I mean, like, I think that's a huge thing, and I think COVID is a prime example of, of what we lost is, you know, you hear all these stories, not just on extremely young children who have cognitive problems because they weren't allowed to be able to see kids' mouths when they speak. They weren't able to be in class to learn. But young people in general spent multiple years in large parts of this country cooped in. They didn't get to hang out with friends. They didn't build any kind of like a, a ability to have social interactions. So now they're just growing on TikTok all I day, think, inter interacting with the uh, fake robots. So I think you guys aren't seeing the silver lining in all of this. I think this is actually a good thing. Like bad, bad in the short run for society. Libertarian Duncan is back. No, 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 no. You're not. You're not hearing me. If we flood the market with AI influencers, mm. you know, going to. I mean, that's basically what we have now. It's just Hold not on. artificial. Right. If it's AI influencers going to Mykonos and AI influencers skiing, you know, in Aspen, and we flood the zone with supply, it puts out of work all the influencers Actual with fake defense. jobs, with fake jobs posting content. Mm. And I think in the long run, it'd be good for society. We get people back you know, oh, off, off, game. off the influencer game. We flood the zone with AI stuff so that the market, uh, you know, is putting AI out. influencers out of work. No, maybe. Put, putting human influencers out of or work. Or human influencers yeah, out of work. Yeah, flooding the zone with AI stuff. But I, as long as we're all on the same page about what we're doing. But at what cost? At what cost? At what cost? You, you, you want a you, bunch of kids seeing these little fake robots? That sounds uh, no. like libertarian Duncan is back. But, no, but, I'm saying you need to ban this. But, 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 what Holmes, First strike what on Holmes China. Asked, <laughs> what, what Holmes asked is at what point does our society move on from this sort of thing? And I wonder if there's not sort of a generational divide that we'll see develop over the next couple of decades where like our generation, which is the last generation to have experienced life without digital media on a daily basis, phones, text, emails, all of it. Mm -hmm where our generation is gonna be like, I just wanna to talk to somebody the way I did when I was a kid. I just wanna have my friends. I just, I don't wanna deal with social media. I don't wanna deal but with- But don't you wonder, don't you and wonder then, if And then the younger generation the younger, yeah. has, knows no difference. And so it's like, our generation might be the last among, in ever, to like look back on those days of what it was like before any of this existed and think, Man, that was so nice. You don't like know victory like you know victory going cold into a bar in college and picking up the hottest chick and, and, and figuring that out. Like, if you are not living that life, I feel sorry for you. That's the thing. It's like now and they don't. Same with, with same with girls. If you don't find the man of your dreams as you're like working through, you know, a, a, a sea of D-bags and figure it out like that that was victory mm -hmm. now the idea that you've got to sort through ai and all of that nonsense troubles me like we're they the can't even make right. eye contact in public anymore let alone try to have a conversation right. at a bar we're the last generation that had a taste of reality and i just really hope it doesn't die with us oh man really well said all right we're gonna go to an interview and the reason we're going to an interview is in large part because smug decided he was not going to play King of the Hill. So I had all my King of the Hill, but Duncan's got to go. But we'll, we'll have King of the Hill. <laughs> it's It'll be a great one next week. <laughs>
<laughs> just completely made up. It's true. Attacking the old man. <laughs> yeah, I will not let that just stand. Fake. It's harmful. True. I will not let Smug. That. Smug didn't want to play it. Yeah. The old man was here. Well, he was we'll, ready to look, do. Look, we'll be back. We'll we'll do two week two week run next week. But this is a great interview. Yeah, excellent let's interview. Get to it. This episode is fueled by the American Petroleum Institute. No matter your politics, no matter the debate, one thing is certain. America runs on affordable, reliable energy. America's policies must recognize that Americans benefit from making, moving, and improving the energy right here in America. Today, America's oil and natural gas industry supports nearly 11 million jobs and provides American energy to keep this nation strong. Learn how at API.org. I want to welcome our next guest, just a fascinating guy. We've been really anxious to have him on for a long, long time. He's the governor of North Dakota. He's also a presidential candidate, Governor Doug Burgum. Welcome to the program. Great. And uh, I'm pleased to hear it's been a long, long time because we've only been campaigning seven weeks. So oh, that well, must be the new definition of a long, long time. Because we've known, we actually have known about you as governor for a long time. Well, that's right, because you've got a sister that lives in Fargo, North Dakota. Indeed. So and they send dispatches. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and, we, <laughs> and we get them. So we've known about your work for a while. Well, we're crushing it up there. There's a lot of good news. So Yeah, there is a lot of good news. Yeah. And it's uh, much of it has come on your watch, which is why I imagine you're now in a situation where you're running for president to try to bring some of that good news to the rest of the country. And as of today, this very day, you've qualified for the first debate. Absolutely. And we're excited because it's going to save about four or five hours a day every day for me because I don't have to answer, uh, are you going to make the debates? <laughs> <laughs> over and over and over again. We're just like, yes, we can. And we can talk about the future of America and how we can improve every life, how we can bring out the best of America instead of talking about some clubhouse rules. Yeah, for... wouldn't it be nice not process-based yeah. questions? Yeah. You can yeah. actually talk about what you do as president? Yeah. yeah. Well, look, this is a this is a big thing. And in a lot of ways, you sort of innovated your way, as you have for much of your life, through a rules process that gets you to that debate stage. And I, most of our listeners have heard about it, the Bergen Bucks. And it, what you did as a campaign to try to get the 40,000 donor threshold to where you needed to, to qualify to the debate. Well, yeah, well, and then we wanted to get there faster than anybody else had, and we wanted to get there with less resources than anybody else had, and we accomplished those two things. Because I think you all know there's these firms out there that say, hey, we can help you do donor acquisition. And I said, well, what's the customer acquisition cost? A hundred bucks. <laughs> and I and went, I, mean, I was like, hey, I can stand on a street corner and sell American flags uh, you know, for a buck. And that, so that idea led to more discussion, and we ended up with the Biden you know, inflation relief cards. Because we do need to, I mean, people are paying too much for their gas. They're paying too much for food. Neither of those items are included in Biden's inflation number, of course. Right. But we said this is a way to do that. And I, I love the fact that some people... Uh, you know, didn't like the fact that we had a, a, a smart hack on how to get this thing done. Well, you went around the system. How dare you? Well, yeah. And then, of course, I mean, the system, let's, I mean, I said, I told the team, we're not going to say one word about this goofy rule until we're on the other side of it, until yeah. after we've passed it in record time. But it was designed to, if you've served national office, if you've been a pundit on a national cable TV or both of those things, if you've run for president before, if you're from a big state with, you know, 20 million, you know, all that it advantages all those people. Sure. And if you're someone, you know, from a small town in a small state with really good ideas, I mean, it's basically designed to say, look, you shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And we just, you know, when, when tell, someone tells us you can't build a software company in North Dakota, you know, you can't build, you can't have the, you know, the highest uh, GDP in the nation in North Dakota. When people do that, it's like just jumping on my start button. And so that's part of what got us, <laughs> and got us going. Also, you know, the best indicator that it was successful in a, in a model worth replicating is it's now been replicated. You know, Miami right. Mayor Francis Suarez today yeah, announced. All kinds of people try to figure it out. He's doing the exact same thing. So clearly, you know, you're trailblazing in that department too totally i i want to get into your background because i think again if for those who follow presidential races closely still what they're reading about with you is the process and whatever the press sort of wants to do in terms of evaluating your candidacy which on the ruthless variety program we think is next to worthless um let's tell your story a little bit because you got a fascinating one software developer you end up uh, i'll let you tell it but wh where do we start well, if you got to start in Arthur, North Dakota, I mean, this town of 300 people where I grew up, and I think the most important thing for listeners is my parents. I mean, my my dad was a World War II vet. I mean, he was a, had a college degree from North Dakota State, 
Pearl Harbor happened and he went down 15 miles down the road to Castleton and signed up for the Navy. This is the guy mm. that had never seen the ocean. I'm not even sure he knew how to swim. Mm. And But they had the 90 day wonder program, they called it. And you know, you're through the Great Lakes Naval Station and you're you're a Naval officer and you're all of a sudden you're a Lieutenant JG on a destroyer. You know, yeah. the brand new destroyer comes out at Bremerton, Washington, you're in the Pacific and doesn't see mom for two and a half years. And, and you know, a lot of people don't understand. I mean, we've seen a lot of movies about World War II, it's always in Europe, but half of the MIAs in the history of American wars from the beginning of our country, half of the 80,000 MIAs are World War II Pacific sailors mm -hmm. never found. Because, you know, what happened at the end of the war, you know, with the kamikazes, I mean, he he was there with his shipmates on the USS Wren at Okinawa and 151 destroyers guarding those aircraft carriers. And they, 129 of them got hit by kamikazes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. he, you know, he made it all the way to Tokyo Bay. Uh, it's a... September 2nd, 1945, MacArthur's there on Missouri signing that. It was his, that was his 28th birthday. Mm -hmm. Wow. And he, and he made it, made it back home. And, and then, uh, you know, they didn't have a place to live. And my mom said, you're not, we're not having a family if we're living on your mother's porch, uh, which is where they were living post-war because there's a housing shortage in America. And so they start a little late. So that's how I ended up with, uh, you know, parents that were, you know, might've been somebody else's grandparents, but I, so I'm, you know, that generation, my mom lived through the depression. She knew how to make ends meet. And when dad passed away, when I was a freshman in high school, she went back to work as a, you know, widow with three kids. And, uh, and so just, you know, the lessons I learned from them about, you know, commitment and community and service, they just, they stick with you. And, and then I, every job I had growing up was, uh, working at the farm, working at the ranch, working at the grain elevator. And I, even when I was an undergrad at North Dakota State, I had a chimney sweeping business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which <laughs> We was, were talking about that a little Jim Chimney. Yeah. We no, thought we'd do a singing Mary Poppins singing was extra. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> people would say, how much extra? I'd say double. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want anybody to, I didn't, nobody wanted to hear me sing and I didn't want them to hear me sing. And uh, so nobody took me up on the double, but I, I was getting paid 40 bucks to clean a chimney and the minimum wage had just gone from 175 to 235. And if a house had two or three chimneys oh, i mean yeah. 120 bucks i could knock down you're a rolling in it oh man when i got back to the frat house it was uh <laughs> it was like, I'd be like like a monthly paycheck for working for the afternoon but i had the top hat the tails i had, <laughs> I had, I had, I had it all I had, that's it, when bergen bucks was born yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah and i had a, i had a 1947 uh red chevrolet pickup that nice. i had borrowed that that was the what i'd show up in when i would do the chimney yield chimney sweep business <laughs> and that was great and then of course i uh, i took that uh there was an ap story that showed a picture of me sitting on top of a chimney in 10 below zero weather <laughs> wearing the top hat and tails and and, uh, and then also climbing up on this icy roof and i at the last second i didn't know what i I didn't know what graduate school was, really, but I, I a guy gave me a copy of Forbes magazine that had listed uh, MBA programs. There was a cover story about you know MBA programs, and I was like, "This is cool," and so I applied to the to the uh, top six schools that were in there, and, and I attached that article about the chimney sweep. And it turns out that either all six schools made. Admission, admissions errors that year or they all were just really hoping to have a chimney sweep uh, in their class it was yeah. a weird affirmative action for chimney sweep yeah, exactly, that point. exactly. Uh, yeah. so we're uh, and so then but then uh, i was in uh, my mid-20s i was working in chicago and at that time everybody was leaving north dakota the population was shrinking the economy was down uh and I was walking down the hall and I walked by Adil Zainalbai's office and Adil was a uh, nickname scratch he went on to become the the uh, head of McKinsey India, and he had a, a Apple II computer with VisiCalc, first spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And I'd been working all nighters, crunching numbers with a TI calculator and a physical paper spreadsheet. And he said, "Hey, check this out." And he hit the button, and it recalculated like in five You're like, minutes. What is this magic? Yeah, I mean, I was like, <laughs> and people always said, "Oh, you were such a visionary about PC software." I said, "No, I I, I got hit in the head with a two by four, <laughs> and it was hard hard to miss that." And I so then I I realized, hey, you could do a software company anywhere. I mean, the reason why people weren't building companies in North Dakota are too far from the customer base, transportation costs, mm -hmm. and like there is no transportation costs. All you need is capital and talent. And I knew all these kids that had left the state uh, to go to work for Texas Instruments, or they were working for the 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 bunch, you know, Burroughs, Unisys, NCR, Cray, Honeywell, or I, you know, IBM. So IBM and the bunch, all these guys that, that left the state. And we went back, and I, I I'd gotten a little piece of farm ground from my dad, not enough to actually farm on, but I mortgaged that, which is a complete something you never do when your <laughs> when your grandparents have homesteaded like on the land. You do not right. take a loan out against it. So against all you know all advice, 
mortgaged that uh, thing, and that became the seed capital for the this startup, uh, Great Plains Software. And we we got kids from over time from 200 different small towns across North Dakota. We That's built amazing. A, yeah, we it was amazing. Uh, it, especially people that knew me, they thought it was super amazing. Like, how, did, how, how did that happen? Uh, but our chimney sweep looks like a rich guy all of a sudden. What but, happened? But yeah, we we uh, we built a two thousand person company, and we had twelve hundred in Fargo, four hundred in rest of North America, four hundred in rest of the world. We had customers in one hundred and thirty countries. We were at the time we went public, we were one of the top uh, five uh, IPOs on Nasdaq. Amazing. And then uh, and then we uh, we were joined uh, Microsoft. They they acquired us took all 2000 of us and then I became a became a uh, uh, executive leading this new division at Microsoft called business solutions mm-hmm. uh, reporting to Steve Ballmer and and then we had a fantastic team there of homegrown North Dakota kids and some others and Sacha Nadella who leads Microsoft now he was one of my direct reports the whole time I was there and and we've got other folks that were you know started in small towns in North and South Dakota that uh, have had incredible careers at the highest levels of Microsoft Tammy Reller chief marketing officer uh, Dave O'Hare is you know CFO of all the commercial business I mean just great success uh, like That's six so cool. like 60 kids that you know started with Great Plains and Fargo ended up moving to Redmond and having these amazing careers and some of them are now either uh, you know retired and helping on the campaign or taking leave of absences to help on the campaign so we've a little bit we got the old band back together and oh. So you've got, got some tech, so you got some tech uh, yeah. expertise. Oh, ab- absolutely. And of course, technology is changing every job, every company, and every industry. But the one place it hasn't touched is is government. I mean, that's one of the things yeah, when I aware. when uh, when Catherine and I decided to take the leap and jump into uh, the governor's race in 2016. The you know there was a, we were down 69 10 in the poll. Uh, you guys, you know, friend Anton uh, and some others decided to, you know, to jump in when we were thing. And, and I told Catherine, I, you know, she was like, wow, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to be first lady. Uh, and I said, don't worry, we don't have a chance. <laughs> <And> it's, like, <laughs> it's only five months till the primary. Uh, but we, uh, you know, we, we ran a campaign and said, look, we're not running I'm, and I'll never be right here. I will never be a senator or a congressman. I'm not. Some people want to put on a jersey, red and blue. Duke it out, lob bombs, great. But I'm an operating guy. All I've ever done is, you know, built build operations and and ex- executed and served customers and and, and defy, tried, the, defy the odds. Yes, I mean you've defied the odds all the way through your career, every step of the way, from when you were a kid through business and then winning this governor's race, where you came from nowhere and you beat the inside guy mm-hmm. who the party was all behind, and then you just you showed up and you won. Yes, which is what makes this presidential run so exciting mm-hmm. for so many people because you're like, here is this guy from North Dakota who's defied the odds his entire life, and he's stepping onto the national stage. Maybe he'll do it again. That's, That's the plan. Yeah. All right, you've read the script. It was, uh, <laughs> so speaking of like the whole underestimating uh, Governor Burgum thing, a couple of weeks ago, I, it, it got it grinded my gears. There were a couple of journalists having a discussion, and they're like, if Burgum's so successful and he's a billionaire, why is he in North Dakota? Which I think just says <laughs> the problem that has faced this country. If you've got people on these coastal elites who have earned that title completely, mm-hmm. not understanding why someone would want to build a business in North Dakota where they're born and raised and focus on keeping the young people graduating in that community in that community. Yeah. 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 I mean, I bet you took that one. Yeah, well. we did. And, and I should, I just wouldn't have to call you after the show. I'll clear it up now. But I mean, one of the most, uh, you know, misreported things is the whole billionaire thing. Because uh, when we got acquired, those are all public documents. I own ten yeah. percent of a company that got sold for one point one billion. Right, right. That does not make not you a billionaire, a billionaire <laughs> but it's a uh, apparently it's a convenient for uh, for people that want to uh, you know sort of sm- you know smash at that crowd. But yeah, so we've been blessed with a tremendous amount of success. But I'd say the thing is not what we've made, but what I've made for shareholders. I mean, you know, yeah. n- ninety over ninety percent of that was created for other people. And then when I had a chance to be chairman of Atlassian, uh, which was a startup from Australia, it's a thirty billion dollar market cap company right now and we you know help build that company and Avalara where I was you know, those guys were a great planes partner with a 10 by 10 booth and they just got acquired last year for eight billion dollars mm. uh, success factors not a lot of strikeouts in the yeah, burger yeah. no, no, yeah. <laughs> I do have to ask you one question because you mentioned Balmer 
Uh, in your list of responsibilities with Steve Ballmer, did any of it ever include getting him hyped up uh, for the <laughs> shows that they would put on for new products? Well, I think it's a Windows 95 launch, right? Yeah, yeah that's because cool. that's stuck in it's my legendary. head. legendary. He's like yeah. sweating a lot. Yeah. He's like, he's amped. I think he's got a pair of New Balances on. He just looks like classic 90s dad. How yeah. much responsibility do you bear for this? <laughs> well, no, I would tell you, I've, I've known actually Steve since graduate school. Oh, wow. And uh, and Steve is just Steve, and, and there's no, nobody can amp up Steve. Steve is <laughs> Steve is there. I mean, you see him on the sidelines of the Clippers game, yeah. and he's a he's doing amazing. He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna build the best uh, basketball stadium that's ever been conceived in the world right now. I mean, it's just amazing what he's doing. But I I have a lot of admiration for Steve and what he's done. But he he brought a lot of passion, a lot of passion to the business for sure. So you didn't have to fire him up. No, he, he did not did fire him up. No, and then and then of course I I played basketball most of my life, and Steve there was a oh, like yeah. there was a six a.m. you know executive basketball league and so i'd always make sure i was in redmond because the kids were in fargo and i'd make sure i was in redmond for the 6 a.m wednesday game and he, you know he'd be as fired up there as you know in a uh, pickup game at the club as he are when the clippers are in the playoffs it hasn't changed I mean, the same level of uh, the same level i there. love that all right so by the looks of it based on your travel you're you're going to compete everywhere it's mm-hmm. not like a regional candidate where we've seen in the past where people are like, well, it's from the Midwest, so he's going to go to Iowa and he'll just camp out there. But you got, you're up to 6%, virtually unknown outside of, of the state of North Dakota. A poll this week had you at 6% in New Hampshire. Obviously, those kind of things don't happen by accident. You've spent a lot of time there. Uh, is that the plan, going everywhere, talking to everybody, just doing everything? That, the pathway for you is everything. Well, we have to because we're we starting with the beginning and you know begin with the end in mind, and you know our whole goal is win the election in November twenty twenty four, and and all of you know better than anybody I've met on the campaign trail because all of you have got deep knowledge about how this actually works. That you know we could all have a sheet of paper right now and go, okay, is a Democrat or Republican going to win California, New York? Yeah, right. What do you think? Yeah, I, right. mean, you know, yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, I mean, pretty good educated guess. I mean, yeah, I mean, two to one registered, you know, yeah. Democrats versus Republican. In the same way, the other states, I think we all know which way we're, where North Dakota's going. Yeah, uh, and name a bunch of other bright red states. Well, then it gets down to what seven states. Mm-hmm. Within those states, we get out of the county map. We all know that every rural county is going red, and we know every you know deep metro mm-hmm. is going to go blue. Yeah. So now we're down to twenty counties. And so, you know, the question, if you want to win the White House in 2024, you know, how do you execute on a race where you could, you know, win the primary, I mean, be the nominee for the Republican Party and not have disqualified yourself from ever even having a chance of beating Joe Biden? Because the goal is to beat Joe Biden. So that's that's the rate where you begin with the end in mind. That's the strategy. And that's what we're executing on. I think you might be the first candidate that went to that second step and actually articulated with all of us have been saying on our show here for months and months which is don't disqualify yourself in the in the context of trying yeah. to win a primary right right um and it seems like what you're talking about certainly very conservative principles and you've governed as a conservative governor um but you do have a relatable tone and i got to imagine that's a part of your strategy as well is it try to get out and talk to people like they talk not like you talk on cnn or you know fox primetime or what have you well I think relatable is key, and of course, we we love uh, we love the fact that the on ramp is Iowa, and New Hampshire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The day after we announced, uh, First Lady Catherine, uh, who's also you know grew up in North Dakota, was there, and we had our first event. We didn't go to Des Moines. Uh, we went to Farley, Iowa, and we we're in you know CJ Beats uh, implement dealership shop, and she kicked it off and stood in front of a hundred Iowa farmers, and her opening words of our campaign were. I love the way it smells in here. <laughs> and, and other than laughing, we had a hundred Iowa farmers that stared at her and they were like, like what? we fell in love. Well, no, not not yet, because they're like, you know, what is she? What is she talking about? And the whole thing. And then she said, hey, well, my my dad had a John Deere dealership, and my sisters and I grew up mowing the lawn, sweeping the floor, working in the parts department. And when when we walked in here, she goes, it smelled like home. That's oh, awesome. Wow. Then they fell in love with her. Oh, yeah. man. So, well, listen, Governor, you've, you've accomplished a lot of amazing things. But I, having met your wife, you, you still did manage to outkick your coverage on that deal. Well, and I, and I think there's actual data to prove this because <laughs> the, the uh, 
in North Dakota, there's only two classes for sports. There's Class A, which is the Fargos and the mm-hmm. Bismarcks and Jamestown, where she's from. All the big, yeah, big the, schools, yeah, those, big, those big city, North big Dakota. city schools, and then yeah. everybody else. Everybody else, you know, all the Arthurs are all lumped into this big thing called Class B. So it's a little bit like Hoosiers. It's like the whole, <laughs> yeah. everybody's in the other thing. And and there is, it's super rare. Maybe it's never happened, but a Class A girl never marries a Class B <laughs> kid. <laughs> and so this was a. I, I wouldn't. This is another. This is another one of those beat the odds yeah. uh, things that we're talking about. I, I, I wouldn't sell yourself short, Governor. You got an incredible head of hair. That is another <laughs> thing. That you got. Well, and, and, and so do all of you. I mean, is that, was that a criteria to get on the show? Was that a? I uh, mean, it doesn't hurt. No, no. I got to say, you got incredible flow. Yeah. You know, I mean, people you, have like, been saying like people a hockey saying. coach almost. Is that the guy know? with the hair? Yeah, yeah. it sure is. Yeah. It well, sure is. You, I, you should see our, our three kids. They got oh, yeah? they got flow. I mean, they got flow. <laughs> wow, it's, it's a, a good salad. Yeah, no, it's a good stuff. But at least I got rid of the ponytail that I had for many years when I was running the software company. <laughs> yeah. But it, you don't have to dig too far in the archives to find uh, find real flow. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> it's it, it's helpful to be a little yeah. edgy in that line yeah. of business. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it, is. It, was, it worked. Yeah, but but uh, but again, I would say with Catherine, the other thing that's been amazing is uh, she's been so courageous. She. Uh, is shared everywhere we go that she's been in recovery from mm-hmm. uh, the disease of addiction for 21 years, and uh, but she didn't talk about it uh, when she struggled for several decades uh, mightily, and then found recovery, and then but was, you know the shame and stigma you don't talk about it even when you're recovery. But once we got elected, she just um, like I said, hey, I'm going to be a face and voice for recovery. Too many mm-hmm. people are suffering, and uh-huh. she Takes guts. she brings it up everywhere we go, and and it's surprising. I mean, this is an issue that touches. Republicans, Democrats, independents, because it doesn't discriminate across, you know, income groups or whatever. And, you know, we're, doesn't matter whether, you know, North Dakota, Iowa, New Hampshire, wherever we go, she shares her story. And then uh, it, people will come up afterwards and talk to her. And just like in New Hampshire two weeks ago, we were at a welding shop there and a couple came up and said, hey, we lost our son. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is not, you know, needle under the bridge, long-term addiction. This is like, you know, you know, somebody buys a, you know, $30 Percocet that they think is Percocet and it's laced with yeah. fentanyl and they find him dead in the bed in the morning because mm-hmm. they thought he overslept. I mean, th- these are, this, and this is happening. 110,000 Americans died in 2022 or overdoses. The year before under Biden, 107,000. That's a statistic that we can't comprehend. Mm-hmm. But think about 330 a day. And 330 a day is, you know, a niece, a nephew, a son or a daughter. And it's, you know, we're taking mass casualties and we got an open border yeah. and we got a president who's part of the job description is national security. National security includes border security and we have an open border. And and again, when, you know, 70% of those deaths, as you said, are fentanyl yeah. overdoses. Yeah. I mean, this is a something. So we, we, we talk about that at every stop. We talk about economy, energy, and national security, but this, the crisis that we're having at the border and the crisis related to addiction. And, and and her work has led to all kinds of policy changes in North Dakota where if you're a fiscal conservative, you know, incarceration is the least effective, most expensive way to deal with addiction. Mm-hmm. If you want to, you know, if you want to have a, a cheaper, if the, a cheaper and better thing, then you've got to figure out a way to move upstream. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so we've been doing that and we've had incredible, incredible success. I and mean, we've got a program in North Dakota called Peer Support Specialists. We have 800 people with lived experience. That's a polite way of saying we have 800 felons mm. that are working, counseling people, and getting paid to be provide peer support. And if they if they help someone get a job, get a driver's license, get a, you know get a job, the three biggest determinants of social determinants of health that keep you out of the criminal justice system, which by the way, you know costs more per year than sending them to NDSU and treatment. You yeah, know, I mean, it's like right. we're. But anyway, if they do those three things, we pay them more. And so we've got folks, and, and in, try, try getting an addiction counselor in rural Western North Dakota. Try getting someone who's a psychiatrist. Yeah. You can't. Turns out that all the uh, research would show that someone who's talking to a peer support specialist every day, texting them, calling them, there for them, providing that support is does is equally as good as any of the, the you know, the multi-year degree stuff. We just wow. got to get people out there. So we know it works. It's way more inexpensive, and it's super less expensive than incarcerating people. You have, you have, hey, we do a war on drug for 40 years, and the enemy combatant is someone who's got a d- disease. It'd be mm-hmm. like having, oh, we're going to have war on diabetes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we're going to have war on cancer. It's like, no, these are diseases. You know, treat them that way. Yeah. Well, this White House certainly isn't doing enough on fentanyl. They're, I mean, nowhere near enough. They're not doing enough on the border. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you're sworn in as president of 
the United mm-hmm. States. What are the first couple things that you tackle on day one? Is is it the border? Is it the is it fentanyl? Is it the economy? What what are your priorities? Well, across the the three, there'd be things to tackle on economy, energy, and national security. Mm-hmm. But since we're on the border, I'd, I've said, hey, I'll be down to the border in the first two weeks. Mm-hmm. Biden didn't get there in his first two years. I've been down there. We've sent North Dakota National Guard down there. I understand the situation. Mm-hmm. It's it's a disaster and it's unreported. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had, we had uh, our troops were covering a 30 mile segment and 30 days I went down there to visit them after they'd been the 30 days. And I said, how's it going? They said, we've apprehended 30,000 people. Oh, in wow. 30 Jeez. days. I said, how's that possible? A thousand a day. They said, well, they walk right up to us because they're told, That's you know, what you gotta do. Yeah. go to the guys in camo, you know, mm-hmm. go to the guys in camo. I mean, it's a hell then, of a message. Yeah. And then there's, you know, 90 mile segment they're covering. And I said, well, okay, you guys are covering this 30 and you got 30,000. What about the other, the other 60 miles? Said, there's nobody there. Mm-hmm. I said, "Where are they?" They're well. They're back at they're back at you know headquarters processing paper, and I mean paper, not. I mean, this is not like you know, this is not a sophisticated you know IT system. <laughs> We're talking pushing paper, and then I we drive by a field, you know, right across the the Rio Grande, and it's all beat down. It looks looks like somebody had like a you know summer western music concert in North yeah. Dakota, where everybody's just parking in a field, and there's like eight porta potties out there. And I'm asking the I said, "What happened there?" And they said, "Well, they surge across five thousand at a time because they know we can't handle it." Jeez. Mm. I said, "Well, what do you do?" I mean. There, there's no infrastructure. There's no food. There's no water. There's no, and they they said, well, you know, we've wiped out the Walmart in town for all the all the bottled water, all the diapers, and and I said, and out here, and there's no shelter and no cover, and they said, yeah, and there's five babies born here last oh week. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh, it's so, I mean, so that yeah, it is, and then and then you, and then I, I I go meet with the officers and the custom border patrol. And they're like, I said, where is everybody? They said, well, anybody that could take early retirement already has, and every nobody we can't hire new people because why would you join? Thankless. Yeah. Why would you join? Why would you join a, a force that's part of law enforcement, where you know an entire party and the leadership in the White House is basically defunding it or ignoring it? I mean, you wouldn't mm-hmm. choose that as a career, yeah. or you'd say, "Hey, I'd like to transfer to the northern border, where the people actually still come in through the border crossings." Mm-hmm. So it's just a disaster from a morale standpoint, and a staffing standpoint, and then from a technology because part of the border, it's not just a physical wall. You build a physical wall and. You know, somebody flies an ultralight over the top of it and drops 50 pounds of enough fentanyl to, you know, kill half of America. Mm. You know, that doesn't necessarily, it stops one problem, but not all of it. We have to have technology, and there's the technology to be able to do all this. We can build a secure border. I mean, we're America. We can do that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we would have to, that's one of the things you'd have to do. But I'd say from the economy, one line. Innovation, not regulation. Energy, one line. Start selling energy to our friends and allies. Stop buying it from our adversaries. There that changes the mm-hmm. entire equation. And those two things, economy, energy, national security, all completely interrelated. Yeah, it's really good. It's really smart. Listen, I got to get you out of here. Your people are going to kill me, but I do have three questions. Uh, they actually, there's been no murders yet. Is that right? By anybody from <laughs> so I don't want to be the first. <laughs> I certainly don't want to be the first. Um, all right. So we ask everybody these three questions. Okay. And I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. If you can plan your last meal on earth, what would it be? Uh, well, bison spaghetti. Uh, when I when I was, uh, you know, it's so some, North Dakota. No, but, but some some dads, you know, some dads, it's like it's dad's time to cook, you know, and you're like, you know, and they're going to get at the grill or do whatever. I mean, that was the, if you asked any of my kids, you know, he only knows how to make one meal. <laughs> Uh, and it's it bison spaghetti. <laughs> Maybe flop around a little couple of walleye in there for yeah. an appetizer, yeah, huh? Sure, yeah, uh, sure. All right, no bison spaghetti. All right, yeah. that's a pretty good answer. Um, all right, second question: If you never got into the line of work that you did, and I don't want to use your public service because it's relatively new, you yeah. only second term as a governor, but you didn't do professionally what it is that you do with software development and everything else, and you just have this blue sky to look back on your life with the benefit of retrospect. And you could fill it with absolutely anything. What would it be? Well, I would have to say that I've been fortunate enough to spend a fair chunk of my youth growing up farming, and I've been able to spend a lot of time, you know, on a horse ranching. And there's something pretty great about about that. I mean, you know, being on being on the back of a horse. I mean, I mean, I think Reagan. He wasn't maybe the first, but he said, you know, there's nothing better for the inside of a, a man than the outside of a horse, yeah. and and there's some element of that. And uh, last Friday night in Big Sky, Montana, I got to uh, ride in the arena, yeah, with the flag, and it, that's I've been able to do that before with uh, 
the guy that raises all the bulls for PBR is a North Dakota rancher, Chad Berger, stock oh, contractor right? of the year 13 times. And you don't have professional bull riding unless you have great bulls. And uh, those North Dakota bulls are the best in the country. So that's that part's you know pretty pretty special. Yeah. But if I but I've had a chance. You said if I hadn't been able to do that, so I'm getting my kind of the ability to live that kind of cowboy dream you know in North Dakota but the thing that I always wanted to be when I was a kid growing up was an architect because mm -hmm. I a bad design drives me crazy and good design thrills me and when I think about the design of software the design of buildings the design of government programs uh, you know part of it is there's just so much potential in great design and when we're designing these jobs I mean 10 to 20 percent of every job in state and federal government is some mind-numbing, soul-sucking, <laughs> purposeless thing that they're required to do because yeah. of some crazy regulation. And we, we passed 51 out of 52 red tape reduction bills. And when we did that, we made the jobs more purposeful and more effective. And that's going to help because we have baby boomers retiring. You got to get young people to decide yeah. they're going to actually come and do this stuff. We don't need all of them. And we can reduce the size of government. I think we can take down 10 to 20 percent of the federal employees there's two million of them and not miss a beat we cut 1.7 billion out of a six billion general fund in north dakota mm. and never st we didn't stop delivering any services yeah. you know during that time i mean there just there isn't there's never been anybody that comes from an operating background that understands it and technology and business process improvement i mean uh, we say treat customers like i mean treat the taxpayers like customers they're paying for everything mm -hmm. and a customer today uh, every citizen that's got a smartphone understands two things. They understand the Apple App Store interface and they understand buying from Amazon. Mm -hmm. And then you could live in any one of these states or deal with the federal government. You could have been paying taxes your whole life. you know. And then you'd say, okay, I go to an audience in any state. How many people have ever got a smartphone? They all raise their hand. How many people have got you know 50 apps? Everybody, more than 100, most people. How many of you have an app from the federal government on your phone? Zero. Yeah. I mean, there's zero. And it's like, no, you want to deal with the federal government as some giant thing. We sent letters back and forth. There's offices. I mean, we're like living in the 1980s in terms yeah. of business processes. It's true. You know, and then you and then you got a, uh, you know, you, 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 anybody that's ever, you know, supported a local group, you give 50 bucks to the, uh, you, know, the you know, the local arts, Boys and Girls Club, you know, Arts Council, something like that. You give 50 bucks and then some kid writes you a thank you note. Mm -hmm. And then we have people that have paid taxes in America their whole life. You know, they don't get a thank you note. No, <laughs> you know, I mean, the opposite. Yeah, yeah. The opposite. We could, yeah, yeah. Where's the rest of it? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. you, know, you, get a, you get an audit instead yeah. of like you know whatever. And it's like these are people that are paying for everything. Let's like send them. Let's thank thank you for creating jobs and what generating a concept, income. huh? You know, and I, I got to tell you, Jeff Holmes, uh, my brother, a product of Grand Forks, North Dakota, a uh, renowned architect, is going to be very happy with this yeah. answer. That is. And was he was he a, a rough rider or? A, uh, he well, no, he he ended up going to Cornell and stayed out east, and is one yeah. of those East Coast el uh, elitists that we talk yeah. about yeah. often of the but, program. But but, but I thought if he's from Grand Forks, he might have gone to Red River High, and they're the Rough Riders. I thought that was the well, well, that was. The, yeah, I don't know if it was the Rough Riders actually. No, they all had, you know, they had names they had to change. Okay. When he was there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hey, and before before we, you toss me out of here, I do want to say, so we're talking to Rough Riders, we are building a presidential library yeah. for Theodore Roosevelt in North Dakota. Oh, I can't wait to see this. And the grand, you're all invited. The grand opening July 4th, 2026, it's been named a, an official USA 250 event. Uh, wow. It's going to be incredible. And here's a guy that uh, transformed himself and then transformed the country. He, his wife and his mother died on the same day in the same house on Valentine's Day of 1884, and he was destroyed. I mean, he they probably today call it clinical depression. I mean, he gave his daughter to his sister and said, I got to... I got to get out of here. I got to go find my soul in the wilderness. And he took the train as far as it go. And the end of the line was the Badlands of North Dakota. And he's said many times, hey, if I would have never been president if not for my time in North Dakota. It was there. He transformed himself into a Westerner. He got on horseback. He built these relationships that all became the Rough Riders. And the Rough Riders then, of course, he wins the Medal of Honor for, you know, charge yeah. up San Juan Hill. And then he goes on to transform our country and really reset in the early 1900s the the balance between capital and labor, and he reset the balance between uh, humanity and the environment, and he did those two things in a way that gave us the whole American century. And then, in the, you know, that we forget is the 2016 election. A lot of it is: are we going for socialism or capitalism? Yeah. And then we've got this idea about, uh, you know, the Green New Deal, uh, and which is again a crazy bad policy for America. I mean, we can't have all. 
we can't have subsidized 500,000 EV charging stations, mm -hmm. not be able to permit a transmission line, kill all the baseload power, so we're destabilizing the grid at the same time we need more of it than ever to charge these cars. And oh, by the way, we're going to subsidize the cars themselves, and you got to buy a battery that comes from China because 85% of the rare yep. earth minerals come from China. So mm -hmm. we just trade... Sounds o like he's been listening to the program. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're just trading trading OPEC for Sinopec. It'd right. Be, it'd be the, it, and, then, and then just like two weeks ago, is it, it, you guys are paying attention. China is threatening to cut off rare earth minerals to Japan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and and that's just you know. Imagine and I, if you're relying upon. Yeah, and I and I talked about my dad. We were in we were in Japan for a trade mission because there's a like 126 million people living on an island that's the size of North and South Dakota, mm -hmm. and they have no oil and gas production, and they and they only produce about two thirds of their calories, so they don't have food security or energy security. And then they're meeting you know North Dakota, and they're like, well, "You guys produce what? I mean, <laughs> produce more oil than m many OPEC nations, <laughs> and we have all this food that we're exporting, and they want to have a relationship." Because when we were there, when we were in a meeting with one of the largest trading companies, and they were all getting the tech system, and some were getting it somewhere, there was a missile being fired by North Korea yeah. at Japan, Jeez. flew harmlessly over mm -hmm. the island. While we were there, I've been in a lot of business meetings, including internationally, none were there, hey, there's a missile coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, but, we, we, you know, so, but they would buy all the natural gas, that we could, all the LNG that we could ship them if you could get a pipeline to the West Coast. Well, it's, I mean, look, it sounds like a plan to us. We are, we are all over this. This has been a yeah. hobby horse of the program. I got to ask you this last question before. Sure. Okay. All right. Our view, every successful person is motivated by one of two things, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. And it's not that anybody doesn't like winning right. or that they sort of like, you know, embrace losing. It's what motivates you to keep going. And you can think of it as like the glass half full optimist, self-motivated or like the Michael Jordan figure who every celebration, every victory he's ever had, it lasts like two seconds. Yep. But like anything that anybody's done, he wears it like a backpack and uses it as motiv motivation to get to the next. Those are the two poles on that spectrum. Where do you find yourself? Well, this is interesting because as an entrepreneur, I described earlier about how I bet the farm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought when I made that bet, there was eight PC software accounting companies. Two weeks later, I went to Comdex. I opened up the book and there were 64 accounting software companies, <laughs> and all of them were better well-known and better funded. And it was terrifying to me, and I was like, wow, I could literally lose the farm and whatever. So, you know, for the next eight years, it was a blur where it was just working round the clock. That's an seven, agony defeat guy. Yeah, That's seven days a week. I'm like, I am not, not going to lose the farm. I'm not, whatever. And then, you know, we'd, you know, we'd win an award, we'd win whatever, but then it was always driven to do the next thing. So yeah. I'm more in the, uh, yeah. the MJ. And I did, go, I did go to MJ's basketball camp as an adult. You did? Yeah, absolutely. No kidding. That's so funny. it was uh, my, uh, I had, uh, uh, my buddy and I, we practiced for six months against each other, you know, getting up every morning early before work and practicing doing whatever. And we went there in 1998. It was the year that he had just won his sixth championship. So he was there. Uh, and then he got about all these top college coaches. And there was 80 guys, and they split you up into eight teams of 10 each. And the uh, uh, it was uh, it was just an incredible experience. That's he, awesome. He he had he had Roy Williams, my buddy had Roy Williams and Lute Olson no, as his coaches. <laughs> my, my coaches were uh, Dean Smith uh, uh. and John Thompson. Oh, Those are the two coaches I had. And, <laughs> you know, so Coach, K, Coach K was there, everybody was there, and it was like the most intense competitive week uh, <laughs> ever of the... So we learned something new here. So yeah. for those listeners who want to follow along, see what you're up to, perhaps help the campaign, where do they go? Uh, DougBurgham.com. Got it. And I'm bummed I, you did not ask me about what animal I would... Want oh, to take down. Well, we, can't, know, we can't miss that, can we? No. Well, we certainly can. I don't, we didn't want to get you out too late, but no. we would love to ask you that question. This is something. Bare yeah. hands, remember? It's mono and mono, bare hands, what animal do you think is Okay, so, so does not does not include like a bow and arrow? No. No, 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 no just just think across the animal kingdom, everything okay. from ants to zebras, what okay. is the biggest animal you could take face on? You yep. could grin it down. You could do whatever you want to do. Yeah, there's but, strategy. I mean, you don't have to like get in a fist fight with it. Right, exactly. But I, I, I was asking about the bow because I have shot a sizable elk at eight yards. Wow. With a bow. <laughs> eight so yards. That, wow. That's yeah. that incredible stalking guts. ability or a death No, it was, it, it was, <laughs> I wouldn't give myself that credit. 23 yards was perfect. Uh -huh. And then uh, he didn't see me and started charging in my direction. Oh, oh wow. You know, because he thought there was another bull behind me that he was going after, okay. and I was in camo, and it's like, I'm going to get run over by this. <laughs> I don't. 
<laughs> they, they don't sh- train you to shoot an elk in the breastplate. In the front, that's, but yeah. that's what I had to do. It was like self-defense. <laughs> 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 but it worked. That's uh, pretty so good. that was good. Uh, but but I, I think I have to say, I mean, it's uh, because of my alma mater and because of everything that's going on in the Theodore Roosevelt National Park and because it's now the National Mammal. But I got to tell you, bison. I mean, I love bison. You can take amazing. that thing right down. Yeah, well, I jump on its back. I'd, I'd be riding it like a horse. We'd be, we'd, be like, we'd be like teammates. He'd be like, I'm with you, man. Let's do this. We're, we're doing this thing. Make it happen. They are so fast. I, I, we were raising bison for a while. Yeah. And uh, they are, you know. People don't understand the <laughs> athleticism of a bison. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, they, they broke every fence we had, and then they said, look, the problem is they can see through your, they can see through your fences. I'm like, well, we, we don't have enough money to build all these new fences they can't see through because then <laughs> we just have like barbed wire. We'd added a fifth wire on top of the fourth wire. So we got- That's the, why you got to start riding these right, things. Right, but, but if you have, you, you don't get to know what a round bale is. I mean, they sure. weren't around mm-hmm. when I was a kid, but these big, huge round bales. So we had a whole row of them piled up on end. So they're sitting on the- you know, yeah. like like cylinders stacked up, and we get all the bison herded up in there. And like six of these young bulls looked around, and they looked at those things, and they jumped up like cats on the top of those. <laughs> You're kidding! And <laughs> over the other side. <laughs> but those are, aren't those like three, three and a half feet tall. Well, they're six feet. They're six, six yeah, feet they're high. They're, they're than as that. tall as any of us in this room, and yeah. they jumped over the top of them. <laughs> and then we were like, "How are they getting out in the Texas car gates that you have that where the cattle can't cross?" We couldn't figure out how they were getting out. Well, they were jumping over those, and those are like twelve feet. So we had to put in double car gates to do that so they're just incredible but they you're look. saying you you're saying you would pacify and tame yeah, yeah, this yes, bison you would have and, and ride then it. ride it ride it ride it you i think that's the it. first time <laughs> yeah. we've seen something yeah, like I mean, that yeah. riding bison all the way to the white house governor yeah. doug Burgum, thank yeah. you for coming thank in thank you here. so okay. much <laughs> all right. great to be with all of you thanks for having us on the show Stay in and touch. uh and I, I know you got relatives in north dakota you're all invited to north dakota yes and love uh, to go and don't don't wait till the grand opening of the tr library come sooner i'd love it i'd love it thank you sir great thank you This episode is fueled by the American Petroleum Institute. No matter your politics, no matter the debate, one thing is certain. America runs on affordable, reliable energy. America's policies must recognize that Americans benefit from making, moving, and improving the energy right here in America. Today, America's oil and natural gas industry supports nearly 11 million jobs and provides American energy to keep this nation strong. Learn how at API.org. He's the best. He's, and you know, my favorite part of the interview, and everybody, we've all talked about our favorite parts. My favorite part is when he got emotional describing his entry into the ring at that rodeo carrying the American flag. That's yeah. what matters, Tim. Yeah. yeah. You could see it, man. I mean, look, this dude is the kind of dude that you ought to give a look. I don't know where everybody's allegiances are in the presidential election. It's the reason we have this podcast is because you ought to hear from everybody. This guy ain't faking it. I mean, straight, He's not I, in it for the wrong reasons. I can guarantee you that. In a nutshell, he came from nothing. He built himself into something great. He became governor. And he's a conservative because he's lived it. The guy killed, you know, he's killed animals that were charging at him. You know, like yeah. his credentials are 100 percent he's also generationally relevant you know i mean look we've had some people on and others where they're talking about stuff that's not totally relevant Mm -hmm. to the society that we live in today uh this dude what he's talking about is actually very relevant to how you ought to govern the united states in this particular era of time and so uh i mean look i'm impressed i didn't know him from adam when he walked in but he did a nice job did a great job i think we did it I think so. Absolute banger of an episode. Gentlemen, thank you so much, Governor Burgum. Fantastic interview. And thank you so much to our listeners. And if you have not yet, subscribe on YouTube. It's free and there will be some bonus content. So until next time, minions, keep the faith, hold the line and own the libs. We'll see you on Tuesday. Stay ruthless. <laughs>